this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter, the 14th through the 16th verse, when you get it, say amen. Matthew, the 26th chapter, the 14th through the 16th verse. Amen. Amen. Matthew 26, 14 through 16, and it reads as this. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Bless be the name of the Lord. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor. Talk to me. Look at your other neighbor. Say, neighbor. Don't ask my name. Put your hands on yourself. Say, so. this morning behind your back. Behind your back. Uh, there was a young lady by the name of Sister Wilson. <laughs> she was the church gossip and self-appointed arbiter or judge of the church's morals. She kept sticking her nose in other members' private lives. Church members were unappreciative of her activities, but feared her enough to maintain their silence. We all know somebody like that, don't we? She made a mistake, however, when she accused Mr. George, a new member of the church. She accused him of being an alcoholic after she saw his pickup truck parked in front of the town's only bar one afternoon. She commented to George and others that everyone seeing it would know what he was doing. Brother George, a man of few words, stared at her for a moment and he walked away. He didn't explain himself. He didn't defend himself what she had even said. He absolutely said nothing. Later that evening, Mr. George cranked up his truck, left his house, and parked his truck in front of Sister Wilson's house, and he let it stay there all night long. Let's give him something to talk about. I wonder what her gossip will be on Sunday when she goes back to church, especially after all of the members have seen Brother George's truck parked outside her house all night long. If we... If we look back in time, we understand that people have been talking for a long time. Amen? Amen. Since the beginning of time, people have been talking. Adam and Eve talked in the Garden of Eden. Through time, more people had talked, but nothing is new about talking. And not only have they been talking, but we've been, we've been gossiping about some things, too. Not only have we been gossiping, but we've been gossiping about things that we think other people want to hear. Gossip is idle talk or rumors, especially about personal or private affairs of others. Amen. We all know some gossipers, don't we? All oh, the ones who ain't talking must be a gossip. We all know some gossipers. 
gospels. Some people who like foolishness. Some people who always keep something going, whether it's true or not. Who gossips? Most gossip comes from people who have issues within themselves. Most of the time, it's because they have nothing to talk about or they seem insignificant when they come around others. And to be relevant again, they will say anything to anyone who's listening. And you know the thing about Christian brothers and sisters, people in general, whenever somebody is talking and it sounds juicy, we give them our ear. We want to listen. We got to hear. We want to hear what they have to say. Whether it's foolishness or not, we lend them our ear. And then the crazy thing about all of this, we will take exactly what they say and take it to someone else and tell them the same exact thing. But we got to add a little flair to it because we don't tell stories as well as they do. <laughs> the reality is they bring offenses on a person who is unaware of their actions. The person that they're talking about don't even know that they're talking about them. In other words, they talk about you behind your back. No matter how you love them, no matter how close you thought you were, they still speak ill of you to others behind your back. And when they speak behind your back, what does this do? This places a negative look on the person that they're speaking ill of. In other words, you don't look so good to other people after somebody done talked about you behind your back. Rather, it's true or not, it destroys the character of the person that gives the people the excuse they were looking for not to fellowship with the accused or somebody. It gives them the excuse not to come to church on Sunday. It gives them the excuse not to fellowship with one another. It gives them the excuse not to sit by you and say, Brother, I love you, or are you okay? All because somebody lied or told a rumor about you that may not be necessarily true. alone will put a stake in the midst of the people and make them uninterested in the fellowship. And here is the kicker. 95% in secret is wrong anyway. Now most of the time when we're talking about somebody, right in the midst of our gossip, that person walked up behind. And sometimes they come directly to you like you should do to them and ask you what y'all talking about. It's funny, we were talking about you, but I hope it was good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Telling the secret to asking the person who walked up, is this particular thing true about what I'm hearing about you? They take what was said in secret and run them up and tell everybody something that didn't really make sense in the first place. Now, where does God fit in the middle of all this confusion? Where does God fit in the middle of all this mess? God is not silent on this subject. Not by a long shot. God got something to say when it comes to the, 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 the things that we do in his house. Just like you, when someone comes in your house and they try to tear it up, we, we, we got something to say about it. My wife and I, when there's somebody that comes into our house and they try to get in the midst and, and, and make us argue or fuss with one another, we got a sin. We said, don't let the devil come in your house and tear it up. And for some reason, these people, they, they, they shut down and, and they laugh it off in the house. Just your <laughs> Not long after that, they usually walk out of the door, but you don't let the devil come in your house and tear it up. What God is saying to us here, as why is King Solomon to write Proverbs, he says this. He says, a worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech. When 
see his eyes, seek news with his feet, points his finger. With a perverted heart, he devises evil continually, showing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be broken beyond healing because I'm sowing discord between the brethren. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and a hand that sheds innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste and run to evil, a false witness that breathes out lies, and one who sows discord amongst the brothers. What in the world does that mean? That last word is my favorite. The one who sows discord between the brethren. If anybody doesn't know what that means, I'm going to tell you right now what sowing discord between the brethren means. In other words, for those of you who lie to get your way and make people fall out and fall apart, that is called discord. Whenever you separate the people that are trying to be together, that is called discord. And so it, what God saying to us, if you go into my house, if you go anywhere within the brethren and you try to tear apart what I have put together, you are an abomination to me and what I am teaching. So in other words, what God is saying to us, we need to stop being so messy in his house. In other words, we need to clean up some mess that we messed up. Three points today. There is nothing to gain. That's number one. Did I mess y'all up? Number one. There is nothing to gain. When you're sowing discord between the brethren, there is nothing to gain. God had already told you in Proverbs that when you do this, it is self-destruction to yourself. You're only hurting yourself because in the end, there is nothing to gain. You're going to be broken so bad that you can't even be repaired. There's nothing to gain. Amen. How does it profit you? What does it profit you to go and lie on somebody or, or tell a rumor about somebody when you haven't even gone to that body to find out if that body had done what you're trying to tell everybody what that body had done? Did I lose you? How you gonna do that? What sense does that make? How does that make you a, a, a better person? How does that lift you up? How does that bring you in the service of the Lord? How does that bring you closer to God? How, how does it do anything to help you gain a little more than what you have? If anything, when people find out that you lied, they never talk to you again. In other words, you only hurt yourself. Once people know that you are a gossiper, they bring you stuff that help you destroy yourself. Oh my goodness, let me, let me tell you, let me see if I can fix this here. Uh, there is someone who is a gossiper. And there's a person that's out to make sure that everybody knows that this person who is gossiping is a gossiper. So what they do is set them up. Amen? Uh, some of us have done this before. You set them up. You bring them something and you tell them, now I'm only telling you this. If it gets out, then I know that you told. And somehow or another, what you told them in secret, after confiding in them, it gets out. And you know you only told that one person. And there's somebody who circumvents that person, comes back to you, and they say, I heard you wasn't doing that good, and that your finances were down, and you had debt, and you were struggling, and you didn't have food in your pantry, you didn't have clean clothes to wear, and, and you were really hurt, and you look at them and you say, well, I know where you got that from. But what did they gain by doing that? They only hurt themselves, because now you never go back to that person for anything. Number two, payment is worthless. After you do what you did as a gospel, and you're waiting on your payment, 
and you get what you think that you want, what did you really get? Some lost friends? Somebody that talks about you now? Come on, y'all. Somebody who don't want to be around you anymore? Some people that want to run you off because you're always causing confusion? And we all know somebody like that, that every time we come around and we gather as a people, there's that person in the midst that we don't want to be around because we know that they're going to cause some confusion so their payment is worthless. They're in your families. They're in your social circles. They sometimes live right next door to you. Some of them are sitting next to you right now. Oh, I'm sorry. So you have to be aware of the payment that you're trying to receive from being the gospel. Number three. Betrayal has no benefit. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Betrayal has no benefit. After you betray somebody, you didn't benefit whatsoever. After you betray somebody, they don't trust you anymore. After you betray somebody, you've lost that friendship. You've lost that relationship. After you betray somebody, there's nothing else to talk about. After you betray somebody, they don't even want to hear your voice. After you betray somebody, they don't want to see your face. After you betray somebody, they don't care to hear your name. After you betray somebody, it's over, it's done, it's kaput, it's finished. After you betray somebody, think about the person that you betrayed in your lifetime. Oh my goodness. And the funny thing is, that person that we betrayed or we, we did wrong, we try to turn, we try to turn it into a Christian thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And we even write it on Facebook to this day. And we use the, the terminology in something like this. Oh, God had moved some things out of my life that just didn't need to be there. He done cleaned my life up because... No, no, no. You ran them off because you betrayed them. Don't try to put that Christian stuff in the midst of your mess. God didn't clean up your life. You ran them off. It's what you did. And we love to do that. When, when you, we do something that causes confusion or causes us to suffer, we love to throw God in the midst of it and say, God is doing something in my life. No, you're doing something in your life. And sometimes it's not the people around you that need to be cleaned up. It's you that needs to be cleaned up. It's us. It's we. Amen. Here in the Bible, and I'm through. Here in the Bible, Judas had went to the chief priests. And while Judas had gone to the chief priests, he had some ideas. He, he had some things. He, he had some stuff that he wanted to tell them about Jesus. And Jesus was supposed to be his friend. There are a lot of us out here just like that. We got some friends that we love, but somehow or another, because they are so good, or they can do some things, some, some things that we can't do, we got to go talk about them to somebody else. And I believe here in the Bible, Judas was upset with Jesus because all of the things that he was capable of doing. So he, he wanted to find out, in, in a sense, was this the real Jesus for himself? And this is with my mind's eye. And I imagine that he went to the chief priest and, and he said, what, what would you do for me if I could get Jesus into your hands? And, and the chief priest said, if you can get Jesus into our hands. If you can submit your friend to me, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you 30 pieces of silver for you to turn in your friend. And Judas, I imagine, thought about what the chief priest had said. And he said, you know what? That sounds like a good idea. And to some of us today, turning in our friend, who's been nothing but good to us, to somebody who don't mean us no good, sounds like a good idea. But don't when you were sick. Don't forget how that friend was there for you when you didn't have no money. Don't forget how that friend was there for you when your other friends turned their backs on you. When your other friends stabbed you in the back. Don't forget how when you were sad and depressed, that friend was there for you. You shall never forget a 
good friend because a good friend will never let you down. You got to keep a good friend close. You got to keep a good friend right by your side. Knowing that they will always be there for you in the midnight hour, through the uptime, through the downs. A good friend will never leave you. But Judas was blinded by what he could get. Get down to the 
you want me to go. Maybe someone who wants to join the church. Yes, that you come. Oh, I know you've been so.